Uh, thank you, T-Rex. That's an excellent reading. Thank you, John, for the script, for the prayer, as well as Sawyer for the song leading. Good morning, brethren. Good morning. It's very good to see all of you. We do have visitors here this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming our way. We strive to teach God's Word, make application to our life. We're part of our worship service where we reverence God by opening up His Word, studying from His Word, showing uh, respect for that, changing our life in that. 2 Timothy chapter 3 is where we're at. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Just for the adult Bible class, one of the reasons I grew a beard is to look more like a, this guy when I'm doing Revelation. Huh? Gives that more professor look. I don't know if it's working though for some of you. All right. Chapter 3, verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, he says, avoid such men as these. What kind of world? Are we living in today? Huh? What kind of world are we living in today? We hear that all the time. You might have said that this morning. I hear people say that all the time about the world that we live in. That's just a, a, a comment on the society and age that we live in. And in so many ways, what that means is that what we've known for a long time as obviously good and obviously acceptable, somehow now we can't even do those kind of things that we've always done in our society and in our life. You want to say the Pledge of Allegiance? Hey, you're going to get sued for that. You want to have a prayer before a football game? Hey, you can't be doing that. You want to say that marriage is just for a man and a woman? You can't, can't be doing that. And so much for so long that has been viewed as obviously wrong and sinful, now in our society has been celebrated, it's, it's celebrated and it's, it's flaunted, and it's just put right out there for the whole world to see. What's the world coming to? I just wonder what the world's coming to. And you know, I want to tell you that the storm clouds are not gathering. No. No, we're past that. The storm is now. We're in the storm. All right? And in our world today, it just seems like without question, there's just an overwhelming flood of evil and immorality that is constantly shoved in front of us. And that people are just bent on dousing the light of the gospel, dousing the light of righteousness, of the good news. We want to bury Jesus Christ, and we want to keep him buried, and we want the flood of darkness and evil to pervade all of our society. That's just what it seems like. Yesterday, I'm not going to do John Lennon. All my troubles seem so, did it? Huh? We didn't talk about stuff that, that, that is so prevalent in our society yesterday. And now, I mean, we didn't used to address the things that are, that are becoming more and more commonplace in our society today. Well, what are we going to do about that? How are we going to live in the society that we live in now? And I look at First or 2 Timothy chapter 3. How do you live in times that seem well described for us? This was written 2,000 years ago, but doesn't this describe how we're living? I want you to think for a minute. This isn't the first time that the world's been in shambles. It's obvious to some of us that, that we know that. Uh, Noah, the whole world, the whole world, eight people. Must have been a bad world. You think about that. And we're discussing Rome, if I can keep doing that in Revelation. Think about that time. The, the discussion of persecuting Christians and what was going on there. And, 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 you know, maybe we need to think that way before we take both hands and push the panic button on how terrible it is here. I mean, the world's been bad before. But it's pretty clear that we live in difficult and perilous times. This is not the world that my uh, papa knew or my great-granddad knew. No, it isn't. We live in what Paul says here, we live with folks that are seekers and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We're no longer part of a culture 
that subscribes to the Judeo-Christian ethics and morals. We no longer live in a society that accepts and, and allows that and that you feel comfortable in that. Those days are gone. Those days are past now. So, so what's this world coming to? What's the question? Well, how, how do I live in that kind of world? This morning I want to talk about that. I want to talk about what it means to live right in the world that is obviously and blatantly gone wrong. And, and I, want to, I want us to understand that, that a lot of that has to do with, with what we choose. And, and we, could exam, we, we, could, we could probably live in this world like, and, I, and again, I think 99.9% .9 of us are living this way. Here's how we live in the world. We whine, we complain, and we moan about how the world is. That's how we live in the world today. Or we could do what Paul told Timothy. We could get into the word of God. And we could see what Paul told Timothy in how to live right in a world that's gone bad. Look at it. And you talk about difficult times in Timothy's day, times of persecution, rampant idolatry, self-absorption. I mean self was put on a pedestal. All of that. False teachers everywhere. And in short, if you look at the Roman Empire and you compare them to 21st century America, now on the outset you're not going to see uh, cars running up and down the main street of Rome, not, not that. But from a spiritual perspective, when you look at Rome 2,000 years ago, you look at America, and I think you're going to find some striking similarities, real striking similarities. What Paul tell Timothy about that, how to live in that kind of society. You interested in that? I want to address that. That's exactly what I want to talk about. Look at verse 10, chapter 3. Look at verse 14. He says, but as for you, and both times when he says that, Timothy gets some ideas, two basic foundational ideas that, that helps him live right in the world that Paul writes about. I do want to say and add a little bit of mix in this. Young people, this lesson, young people, is not for you, just for you this morning. But Timothy was a young man. I think we need to acknowledge that. But I would say this, that in uh, verses 16 and 17 of this chapter, as I look at that, there are two of the most famous verses of all time. We read them all the time. We quote them all the time. But I wonder sometimes if we know the context of the passage and, and we know the immediate context and look and, and really notice what these verses are about. And, and I, it would be of interest to me to wonder why, or the, as the, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to pen that, why did Paul feel like he had to write down all scriptures inspired by God? So let's begin thinking about those things as we work together. Let's look at verse 10. He says, Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and suffering such as has happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving, he says, and being deceived. Now you look at that, I want you to notice there's a strong emphasis on wrong religion. There's a strong emphasis on false teachers, false doctrine, false religion. Now, one of the first things that Paul says to Timothy you're going to learn to live in the society that you live in. First thing, you're going to need to learn to stand alone. You're going to need to learn to stand alone. Look at verse 10, my steadfastness. Verse 11, steadfastness, what? In the face of physical persecution. Now, I want you to remember that Timothy grew up in Lystra. And Maybe, and, I, and I, I don't know, not, but not only had he heard about the missionary team that showed up there, maybe he was an eyewitness of the stoning of Paul who was left for dead that Luke records for us in Acts chapter 14. Maybe he's seen that. But what he says here, Paul said, you know, you knew that I was left for dead. All right? But I want you to take note of what I did. Listen, I'm not going to go with the world. If it means that I'm going to die, I'm going to stand alone. I'm willing to, to stand against what society is saying. And I'm willing to take it that far. And what he's saying is, you'll have to do that. You'll have to be able to do that. You'll have to be strong enough to do that. And I'm going to tell you something. You mark it down. False teachers 
Never do that. I'm telling you what, one of the marks of a false teacher is they got the biggest crowd all around them, patting them on the back, getting all kinds of acceptance, all kinds of accolades. Oh, he's the greatest. False teachers will never stand alone. They enjoy that. They want to fit in. They want to fit in with everybody. What everybody's saying out there, that's a false teacher. And the whole time you know what they're saying about you? Oh, those Christians are so intolerant. Well, turn to John chapter 15. I want you to look what the Lord said. You want to be involved in the ways of the world? Look at John. Hold your mark there, chapter 3. But notice what he says in verse 19. Jesus says, if you were of the world, John 15, 19, Jesus says again, if you were of the world, the world will love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, he says, the world will hate you. That's it, isn't it? That's it. Folks, you don't want to be unpopular. No, we want to be liked. We don't want to be unpopular. We don't want to be pressured. We don't want to be persecuted, do we? No, no. So what? You're not going to stand alone. That's, that's the world. Now turn back to 2 Timothy 3. Look at it. I want you to notice again verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly, what's happening there? We're going to suffer persecution. But evil men and apostles will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is the road. Paul's talking about this is the road that you're going to go down if you don't stand up and stand alone. When you care more about what people say about you and what people think about you, when you care more about that than what God says about you and what God thinks about you, well, what happens? What's he saying? You're going from bad to worse. Isn't it a crime to deceive yourself? I can't think very much of anything, there's anything worse than deceiving yourself. Paul's seen it, Timothy's seen it, we see it. I know that you know the name of Rob Bell. I mentioned that guy a hundred times. He's a big time writer and not everybody follows the big time authors in, in the uh, religious world out there, but I mentioned him before. He, uh, <clears throat> the Chicago uh, Times said that he was the greatest thing since Billy Graham. Time Magazine said he was one of the most influential Christians of all time. All of this, church of thousands. Then Rob Bell started hobnobbing around with the world and all the celebrities and all that, Oprah and all that. And where's Rob Bell now? In a recent interview, Rob Bell uh, decided that gay marriage was all right and that everybody, and I mean everybody's going to heaven, all right? And morally, and really, Rob Bell's at the point now where he's not even anywhere close to what the Bible says. You know anybody like him? You know anybody? Do you know anybody that, that for instance, has, has rejected the Scriptures and has grown closer to God? You know anybody in your family, in your life, that, that, that has rejected God's Word and goes to church more, has become more faithful? See, that's not how it works. What, what, no, no. You go from what? What's he say? Bad to worse. That's exactly what Paul says. Now, which means when you and I contemplate the world and we go, what in the world is this world coming to? Paul answers it for you. I'm going to tell you what it's coming to. It's going to go from bad to worse. That's what Paul says. He answers that. Which means for those of us who want to be faithful, what we need to learn, we need to learn how to do what? Stand alone. Sometimes, I think it seems like we've lost our sea legs a little bit in that. You know, we're, we're rocking and rolling, the ship's plunging up and down, the big storm that we're out there. And we really sometimes, you know, we, 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 we lived in a country, we lived in a society where Christian values were accepted. And we fit in. And, and we were comfortable with the way our society treated us. All of us, yeah. But now, I want you to know, what, what is that? You don't know what you have till it's gone. It's gone. Wake up. It's gone. We've been blessed for years and years. And I want to tell you something. That's not how it's been for 2,000 years since Jesus Christ died in other parts of the world. Did you know that? This isn't, uh, th that's not been the rule. What's been going on in this country has been the exception, not the rule. You ever try to be a, 
You want to be a Christian in Saudi Arabia? Go for it. How about China? Huh? Think about that. So for a period of time in this country, we were blessed with peace, safety, and, and approval by our own culture. Now that that's all changed, we're all, we're all going to go, what, what? what? I, I can't believe what, what's happening. Paul, Paul tells you what's happening. And Paul's saying, look, this is normal. This isn't abnormal what we're going through now. This is the way it's been for 2,000 years for everybody. Get ready. You need to realize that. We should expect that. This is exactly how society treats Christians. Look at verse 12. All, all, verse 12, who desire to live godly. Life in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. You ready for that? You ready? How about the steadfastness there? Is that you? Verse 10. Mom and dad, you talking to your kids about this? Are you talking to your kids about what it's going to actually mean to live in this society as a Christian? They're not going to hold your hands up and say you're a great kid and pat you on the back for all the great things that you're doing. No, that's not it. You're going to be derided. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be put out. You ready for that? You teaching your kids that? You warning your family about that? It's just not our kids. Go to work. Go to school. Go downtown. Go anywhere. I mean, and, and you know, your relationship with your neighbor across the street. All of that is colored by what? What? Oh, he's one of those Christians. He's one of those Christians. You ready for that? People make fun of you. Awkward conversations. People don't trust you. All because you have made a stand for Jesus Christ. You getting ready for that? I don't think we are. I think we're just belly aching. I think we're just crying and wishing nostalgically for a day gone by when America was... Those days are gone. It's time to get real. It's time to assess where we're at. It's time to assess if we're ready to do battle and stand up for truth and right and take a stand for Jesus Christ. You doing that? You thinking that way? You ready to stand alone? If that's what it takes, Timothy, if that's what it takes to live right in a society that's gone wrong, you better be ready to do it. And I think Paul's word rings out to us. I think it rings out to us clearly. What else? He talks about the power of the Scripture here, verse 14. The importance of standing fast in Scripture. Notice what he says. You, however, continue in the things that you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, he says. All Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God will be perfect, fully equipped, he says, for every good work. Well, what's happening? Evil men are going to do what? Get worse and worse. Evil men are going to be deceiving and deceiving more and more. But not you, Timothy. No, society and culture and men, they're going this way. But not you. You're going to go a different way. Instead of swaying with the culture, instead of swaying with the spirit of the times and the ideas and the attitudes of the time, no, you're, you're going to do what? You're going to recognize your need to do what? He says, be steadfast. Verse 14, steadfast in what? In the things, verse 14, that you have learned. In what you have learned. I love that because he talks about where he learned that. And you look at that and you know the text, you know the book. He's talking about Eunice and Lois. That's who he's talking about. He's talking about his grandmother and his mother. His grandmother and mother taught him the faith. They taught him the gospel. They taught him the scriptures. Now, I think Paul had a part in that because, again, Paul was Timothy's mentor. Verse 10, he says, uh, uh, my teaching. That's, that's the word I'm looking for. You know my teaching. These folks taught Timothy the word of God. These folks taught him the faith, his dependence on it. And what's the, what's the message? In dark times, when it's bad times, what's he telling him? You stand on the scriptures. 
Now, young people take note of that. All three of those folks are older than Timothy. Eunice, Lois, Paul, all right? All that instruction came from then. I'm calling that to your attention because, you know what, as you grow older, uh, there comes a point in your life, I recently got over that about 10 years ago, that no matter what somebody tells you, if they're older than you, <laughs> no good. Y'all you know I mean? Consider the source. Somebody told me something and they were older than me, so I don't, yeah. It's not like when you're five, remember that? Hey, Dad, how come the sky's blue? That's your mom's favorite color. All right, moving on. Glad to know. But now when you're 16, 18, 20, that, that doesn't cut it. You, you ask honest questions and you don't want some answer that's glossed over. You don't want some quiz, quick answer or all that. You really want to know what's up. You really want to know what's going on. And so you ask those questions. You ask questions because you want to know the answer. And I want to say on the outside, that's good. That is very good, young people and young men and women. Hey, that's good. Establish your faith. I, you want to know why you believe what you believe. You need to do that. You need to know that. But here's the problem. Sometimes when you get an answer, and it's from an older person, pff, I've heard that all my life can't be right. That's what they've told me all my life. That's what my mom and dad said. That's what the preacher said. That's what the Bible class teacher said. So all of that, forget that. And what is, that's all just discounted immediately. Now what's the opposite of that? Well, if you're with somebody your age, somebody 21, 25, younger, hey, if they say it, guess what? It's automatically true. Well, it's got to be true. See how that works? You need to be careful about that. Paul did not tell Timothy in troublesome times, you need to find some new teaching. You need to find something new and fresh, something you never heard before. You need to, to get out there and reject everything that you've been told. Don't, don't you remember what your mom and dad told you? Don't you remember what you learned at the church? Don't you remember God's word anymore? No, 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 that's not the answer. You want something else. Verse 14. In the things that we have learned and received from where? Verse 15, childhood. We want to continue in those things. The term continue there is the same word, group of words that comes from abide. Abide in the doctrine of Christ. We're not going to show prejudice to the word of God. And we are not going to reject it out of hand because our parents believed it or because it's been part of our lives, or because the preacher said it, or because the elders said it. We are not turning away from those things. Instead, what's the admonition? Continue in those things that you've known since you were a child. That's exactly what verse 16 and 17 is all about. In place of false doctrine and false teaching, no, not a bunch of traditions, no, not a bunch of human wisdom, no, not a bunch of human ideas and opinions that men have handed down. No, that's not what this is about. We are going to continue in what? Verse 15, in the sacred writings. What are those writings? Look at them. They've been what? They're the words of God that have been what? Breathed out by God. Let's make sure we understand what Paul is telling Timothy as well as us. Scripture comes from God. Folks, that means it's true. And if it's true, then it's reliable. It's going to do useful stuff for you. That's what the Bible does. That's it. That's, that's the inspiration. The Word of God will teach you exactly what is right. The Word of God will teach you exactly what is wrong. The Word of God will let you know when you are wrong. It will let you know when you are right. It will let you know when you're off the path of what is right and it will get you back on the path and the word of God will keep you on the right path. That kind of thinking was attacked in Paul's day just like it's being attacked today. And you look at the epistles and all the things that he wrote to Timothy again and again and again. He's talking to people He's talking to false teachers. You know what? They are not interested in what the Bible says. No, sir. And I think it's amazing how little things have changed. Today, 
We are experiencing God. God is telling our hearts. We're having that personal thing from God that comes directly from God. He's telling it. He's feeling, we're feeling it in our heart. And if you're passionate enough and you believe it enough, it's from God. What is that? Nothing. That is nothing but replacing the scriptures with your own feelings and your own emotions. That's what that is. And I'll tell you what, the excuses to, to, to dismiss scripture, it just keeps going on and on. Oh, the Bible's not the pattern for our life today, is it? Nah, there's nothing in the Bible about a pattern of righteous living, is it? Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, to do what? Follow what? The pattern of what? Sound words. Where else are you going to get that? Where else are you going to find that pattern? I'll tell you something else. The Bible is not a pattern of how we ought to worship God, what we ought to do in worship, or anything else. It's, it's come one, come all, and do what you feel, and go with what you feel. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 15. He says, in this case, I'm delayed. I write so that you know how. We need to know how. We're instructed how. One ought to conduct, behave himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth, over and over again. In First and Second Timothy, Paul confronts those that are not interested in Scripture, but he answers them every time with Scripture. And folks, what's the Bible? The Bible! The Word of God is what we need. And I want you to notice something. Let's go back to 2 Timothy 3.15. He says something there that it will make you wise unto what? Salvation. The Scripture will make you wise unto salvation, he says, through Jesus Christ. What Scripture is he talking about in those verses? Well, primarily the Old Testament. <coughs> but the Old Testament, I don't, you can't make you wise unto salvation for Jesus Christ. The prophets didn't know what was going on even. So, He's talking about that, but he's talking about the New Testament, which was being compiled at the very time of this writing. And what he's saying to Timothy is that, that you need to pay attention to, you need to know, you need to, to, to read, you need to abide in all of the Scripture. That, that's what he's talking about. And folks, that's Paul's answer for the difficult time. It is an absolute timeless answer for the difficult times that we live in. Because each and every time, in every tribulation, in every trial, in every good time, in every bad time, what is it? God's word remains the same. It never changes. Think about it. It reproves us. It teaches us. It corrects us. It teaches us how we can be saved. It teaches us what pleases God. It teaches us what displeases God. It teaches us how we can go to heaven. Where's it all going? Well, Timothy, I don't want you wringing your hands. I don't want you worrying with anxiety about how bad things are. What's this world coming to? Read the Bible. Stand on the Scriptures. That's what he's saying. That's the exhortation. Can you see the application today? You know what? All the crying around, all the complaining, that won't do a thing for your courage. It won't. It just won't. All the moaning, all the, you know, it, it won't do a thing to help you conquer temptation. It won't do a thing to help you do the battle out there. Read your Bible. Stand on the scriptures. I think 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 through 17 is one of the most powerful sections of scripture that's ever written. Ever. Paul says, as for you. What? You learn to stand alone. As for you. What? You learn to stand on the scriptures, folks. That's good counsel for us. That's so applicable to us. Get your songbooks out, please. This is not my granddad's or my great-granddad's America. My granddad never worried about online pornography. He never worried about terrorism. He never worried about same-sex marriage. You know, those days are gone. Instead, I believe we need to wake up. We need to acknowledge exactly where we are in this country. We need to assess exactly our place in the society that we live in. Instead of looking for the good old days gone by, I promise you they are not coming back. We are going to go from bad to worse. 
We need to look at what the apostles' inspired writing teaches us and admonishes us what to do. When we live in difficult times, it's described here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, what we need to do, I'm telling you, the answer is in Scripture. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's the only gospel that I can preach. That's the only gospel that will save you. There's no other gospel, Paul said in Galatians chapter 1. Jesus did not say, he that believes and accepts me in his heart will be saved. That's a lie. You'll be damned to hell if you think you're saved in simply doing that. Jesus did not say you can believe and be baptized whenever you feel like it. That's a lie. He that believes and is baptized is the gospel, the only gospel that will save you. Please come as together we stand and sing.